the Houston Philosophical Society at Rice University. At the opening of the Rice Institute in 1912, now Rice University, its first president, Edgar Odell Lovett, made clear its obligation to spread new learning in literature, science, and arts to the citizens of Houston, not just its enrolled students. That goal was extended in January 1920 when several faculty members organized the Houston Philosophical Society to bring together monthly faculty and civic leaders in science, medicine, the law, and humanistic disciplines for dinners and for lectures on the newest developments in those fields and others. Today, this organization continues to serve as a knowledge accelerator. It brings the latest ideas and discoveries to an intellectually curious membership through the form of popular and accessible lectures. Since 1927, the Society has met at the Cohen House Faculty Club on the Rice University campus, and it still reaches out to the broader Houston community and its various academic institutions for new members who are excited about sharing innovative ideas across the spectrum of professions and learned disciplines. This Town Gown Society sought to engage both academic leaders and various civic leaders in exploring the world of ideas, the thought being that such interaction could enrich the lives of all participants. For over a century, these meetings have expanded friendships and broadened the perspectives of the members of the Houston Philosophical Society. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's nice to see a few of you. And obviously, we have had these musical preludes uh, to allow people to come into the room, Zoom room and arrive in our Zoom room. Um, it is my pleasure to continue that tradition that so many of you seem to like very much to have um, a little music before our meetings. And since unexpectedly, I guess in, in some ways, we have to continue virtually, at least for this month and next month, um, we will continue with music too. So I'm happy to introduce to you violinist Maria Lynn. Maria is from Rockland County, New York, and has degrees from the New England Conservatory and the Eastman School of Music. Maria has performed at numerous music festivals, including Tanglewood, Spoleto, Sarasota, Grand Teton, and the International Musician Seminar at Prussia Cove. As a soloist, she has performed with the Rockland Symphony, the Hudson Valley Philharmonic, the National Repertory Orchestra, and she gave her debut solo recital at the Carnegie Hall's uh, Wild Recital Hall, sponsored by the Asian American Foundation for the Arts. She has taught privately and at the Interlaken Music Festival, a music center. As a freelancer in the Northeast for many years, um, she moved to Houston in 2000, in, in the year 2000. And since then, she has been performing with the Houston Grand Opera Orchestra, the Houston Ballet Orchestra, the Mercury Orchestra, the Bach Society, uh, Ars Lyrica, and La Speranza. Maria plays a violin that was made by Giovanni Battista Gabrielli, made in 1770, and she will tell you more about this wonderful instrument. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Maria Lynn. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me this evening. It's a pleasure to be playing for you all tonight. Um, so this violin, was made in Florence, Italy in 1770. Um, and I have it set up for his what's known as historical performance, um, which um, means that the instrument uh, resembles very closely um, how it would have been um, 
back in the day that it was made and used. Um, I mean, there's a lot of speculation about his historical performance, of course. Um, but one thing that is for sure is that um, there were no chin rest used, um, no shoulder supports. Um, the bow is a very different model of bow. Everything has a much lighter tension. The strings are all in a lighter tension and they're made out of natural material, um, some sort of gut, uh, sheep gut or cow gut or cat gut. And, um, and it makes for a different timbre of sound and the, and the pitch as well was lower. Um, and um, so and stylistically, there are many differences too, um, which I hope you will hear tonight. Um, but um, anyway, it's lovely to be able to use this instrument this way since it was made in 1770. And that was really only a couple of decades after um, these composers uh, whose music I'm playing tonight um, lived. You know, I think Bach, you know, lived until 1750, you know, and Telemann also, um, George Philly Telemann, whose music I am also playing, um, lived um, around that time period. So, um, yes, this this music was was um, playing their creation, this violin was playing their creations, I believe. So I'm going to start with the Sarabande from Bach's B minor partita for solo violin. So that Sarabande was a slow dance um, from what is called a partita, which was a composition um, made of several dance movements. Um, and Bach has three of those. And I will be playing some more of those dances um, after we move over to George Philippe Telemann. And so he wrote a couple of Fantasias for solo violin. They're you know, it, in a fairly standard sonata form with a 
a slow opening movement and then a quicker movement and alternating with a smaller movement and a quicker movement. And um, uh, at the word Fantasia suggests, you know, some degree of freedom and fancy. And um, so I enjoy that aspect of these Fantasias.
All right, we're gonna go back to Bach. And this time I'm gonna play a movement from one of his unaccompanied sonatas. And these are not dance movements, they're in rather traditional sonata form. And this is, they're all amazing pieces, but this is a very beautiful movement, one of my favorites. This is the Andante from the second sonata.
All right. Next, we're going to go back to one of the partitas and play another dance. So from the E major partita, this is the Gavat and Rondo. Now we're going to go to the third sonata, and I can't play sonata for solo violin in C major. And I'll end with the largo from this movement. Yeah. And this is um, the first thing I always play whenever I move into a new home. Oh.
Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Alan Levander. I'd like to welcome you to the Houston Philosophical Society fall season. Uh, I hope you all had safe and productive summers. I'd like particularly like to thank Maria Lynn for the violin recital. Um, as you can see, we're still meeting via Zoom, and this is going to continue at least through October, I would expect. Uh, Rice just today removed restrictions on the size of in-person classes, so we'll see how their policies evolve. I'm sure everyone would agree that it's been an extraordinary year. The U.S. has a new president, we have a new Congress, and we have a new Supreme Court. The state of Texas has passed a number of new laws that have made national headlines. After the optimism of the early summer due to the vaccines, the pandemic has resurged with the Delta variant. And in the news, in the Congress, and in almost every state house in the US, the issue of election security has been a hot topic since before the fall 2020 election. Election security is the subject of tonight's talk. Our speaker, Dan Wallach, is a national figure in election security. Dan is a professor of computer science at Rice. He's also a member of the electrical and computer engineering department. He is also a Rice scholar at the, the Baker Institute for Public Policy. He holds a bachelor's from UC Berkeley and MS and PhD degrees from Princeton. His intellectual interests are computer science and cybersecurity. He served as the associate director and the director of an NSF funded uh, multi-institution research center that was called Accurate, a center for correct, usable, reliable, auditable, and transparent elections. He has testified before the Texas Senate and the US Congress on election security. He served on a number of uh, cybersecurity panels for the Department of Defense in academia and in industry. He's been heavily involved in the Advanced Computing Association called either Usenex or Usenex, depending on whose internet pronunciation that you believe. He's received research awards from IBM, Microsoft, Google, and Samsung, so just about everybody. And he is a National Academy of Sciences Cavalry Frontiers of Science Fellow. He is now a member of the U.S. Election Assistance Commission Technical Guidelines Development Committee. And while he's been at Rice, in addition to typical faculty service, he was the faculty sponsor for the Rice Social Dance Society. And he tells me that uh, he has been biking a lot. And since the pandemic, he's about doubled his mileage. So his lecture tonight is entitled Adventures in Electronic Voting Security. Welcome everybody to the Houston Philosophical Society's meeting. I'm sorry we have to do it virtually, but well, COVID. Anyway, today I am going to talk to you about some of my research and adventures in the world of electronic voting security. I'm a professor in Rice's computer science department, and I'm gonna just be describing some work that I did last year while I was on sabbatical, working with a not-for-profit called Voting Works. More on them in a minute. So my research looks at electronic voting security. I look at vulnerabilities in older voting systems that generally don't use paper ballots, including the one that we only just recently stopped using here in Houston. And I look at newer processes, procedures, techniques, and software to improve new voting systems to be more secure, more reliable, and more auditable. So there are many, many, many problems that we could talk about. We could talk about how we do vote casting and tallying. We could spend hours talking about the exciting world of gerrymandering, which is drawing districts in a way to advantage one party or another. We could talk about newer concerns like nation state adversaries, misinformation. There are a lot of people trying to control the outcome of an election. And 
But today, we're not really going to talk too much about that. We're mostly going to be talking a little bit about the nation state adversaries and then a little bit about cool new technology. So I'm going to start a story in August of 2016. And as you can see, the November election is a mere one, two, not even three months away from where the story begins. And our story begins with this article in the Washington Post where we learned that Russian hackers were doing something. We didn't quite know what, and we still don't entirely know what. They were doing something to Arizona's election systems. And not but a month later, here I am giving scintillating testimony to the House Space Science and Technology Committee, where nobody told me anything more than what I read in the newspapers, but they were saying, what do we do? What should we do? And, well, I did my best. A month later, here's then-President Obama speaking from the White House, directly naming Russia. That was a big deal because at the time we were hearing it as rumors or sources say, but now we were getting it straight from the top. And that meant that he was speaking with the full force and knowledge of the nation's intelligence community. So that meant that we, we treated this as a serious threat to the election. This is one month before the election. By this time, we had learned that 33 states and 11 county or local election officials had requested the government's help. Several months later, we learned that 39 states had been compromised. And so here we are in June of 2017, and we're still today learning more about what exactly happened then. Um, the scope and sophistication so concerned the Obama administration that they took the unprecedented step of complaining directly to Moscow. I don't know what was spoken on that phone call. I imagine it was, we know what you're doing, and here are some really terrible consequences for you unless you stop this thing that you're doing right now. So everything I'm describing now is based on public sources and newspaper articles. I don't have any more information than anybody else. But it's still worth asking the question, what exactly did the Russians do? So first, let me take you to a f something that you've all dealt with in your email, which is called phishing. So these are spammed emails trying to steal something from you. Often it's your password or credentials. Sometimes it might be your bank account data. And you've perhaps seen an example I put on the right. Dear sir, I've been requested by the Nigerian National Petroleum Company to contact you for assistance. They're not from the Nigerian National Petroleum Company. And there isn't some magic free pot of money if you only would assist them. Instead, what they're trying to do is empty your bank account out. This sort of thing has been around for years. And even though the response rate is incredibly small, it's nonetheless profitable for the people who do this sort of thing. So that's a phishing attack. What the Russians did is a more sophisticated version of this that we call spear phishing. So in this case, they were targeting one person, in this case, John Podesta, who was Hillary Rodham Clinton's campaign manager. And on the right is a copy of the email that he received. You see, it looks, it has a Google logo. It has a Google security looking shield icon up in the corner. It looks googly. And what it says is somebody in Ukraine is trying to do something. Click here to change your password. At this point, nobody in Ukraine has anything but um, apparently Podesta went to somebody at the DNC and said, hey, is this legit? And allegedly, they said, yes, it was. And he clicked the button, and that was what allowed um, Russians to get into his email and make copies. So in this case, regular antivirus scanners, regular phishing scanners rely on the same thing going to millions of people. That's one of Google's key tricks for keeping phishing emails out of your mailbox, which is they see it over and over again. This was sent to an audience of one and engineered for one person. And that's much, much harder to detect and stop in advance. It's also worth taking a brief digression to talk about the other thing that Russians were up to, which was propaganda in the 2016 election. So this was a Facebook ad purchased by the Russians, here trying to rile up people on the American right, 
to say, you know, vote for Donald Trump or else. And what we see is, in this case, March for Trump is actual Russians, but the actual Tennessee Republican Party retweeted them. So part of the magic of good propaganda is it grabs people and it makes them retell it. So it's not just that you directly convince somebody, but that you cause somebody to pass it along. And that virality is key to being an excellent high-tech propagandist. And it's also worth noting that the Russians were not just going after the American right, they were also going after the American left. In this case, trying to get uh, certain people on the American left riled up at things happening that might be legitimate. But you can see what they're trying to do. They're trying to get everybody angry. And for all of you remember in 2016, everybody was quite angry. So the Russians were accomplishing their objective. I should even mention that they created an entire Facebook group called Texas Antifa, which is no such thing. And they had Texas Antifa threatening to remove the Sam Houston statue in Herman Park. And this led to a right-wing group called This Is Texas organizing a rally to defend it. And here they are, you know, just minutes away from the Rice campus, putting on a very real protest to defend a statue against a fantasy of a threat. And nobody ever planned to touch the statue, yet those are real Ku Klux Klan symbols and slogans. So the ability of the Russians to stir this up is really quite astonishing. The social networks, to their credit, did respond. You know, here we have Russian state news saying, oh, there is an outcry. Is Twitter cracking down on people? But um, in fact, Twitter removed at least 70 million accounts at the time, and they continue to do this to try and get rid of fake actors who are trying to manipulate global opinion. And Facebook is doing this as well. So one would hope that we learn some lessons from 2016 and would try to do better in the future. Most notably, in 2018, we learned, we learned this. Note the date, February 2019, that US Cyber Command, that's the military, attacked a Russian troll farm on election day of 2018. You know, it's not the old way of doing business anymore. And here's a quote from Senator Mike Rounds, Republican of South Dakota. The fact that the 2018 election process moved forward without successful Russian intervention was not a coincidence. That's a striking statement. Wow, I would love to know the details behind this, but they're not really public. Best I can tell, for those of you who were aficionados of Game of Thrones, this is operating beyond the wall. This is not just being defensive, but being offensive, going out to assess and degrade threats on the other side. So operating in enemy territory. And it's important to note that private industry, civilian cyber people like me, I can't do this. Even if I had the hacking chops and a lab full of students ready to, to launch attacks, this is a thing that I can't do, but it is a thing that the military can do, and they did it. So that's, that's amazing. What about 2020? Very few details are public. So here is a tweet from the director of Cybercom, General Nakasone, saying that we are working 24 seven with our partners to safeguard the election. And you know, here's the director of the FBI saying, we're not gonna tolerate foreign interference. Um, in a report that came out after the election, we, and this is very, very weak on details, but nonetheless, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence describes election influence operations, but not election interference. So there was still some amount of propaganda from Russia and Iran. That's what they attributed. There might have been more. But they, it's the intelligence community's assessment that there was no, at least no successful, election interference. But there, boy, was there a lot of crazy. This is former director of the Cyber Infrastructure Security Agency, Chris Krebs. Krebs said 
that this was the most secure election in history, and he knew what he was talking about. He was in charge of the piece of the U.S. government, which worked closely with election officials, state and local, all around the country. CISA was created in 20... The congressional action to make it happen was in 2016, and the agency really came together in 2018. And CISA is... Election officials all around the country love it because they showed up and they helped them just clean up their networks, improve their security, install network intrusion detection and monitoring systems. It was basically free security consulting for our nation's election administrators. And so he knows what he's talking about when he says that this was the most secure election in history, yet Trump fired him. And more recently, a man who sells pillows was offering a $5 million bounty if people could disprove his allegations of voting fraud, and he created a cyber symposium and invited a number of actual security experts to go to South Dakota, where he was going to give them evidence that they could see that was definitively proving, I don't know, something. Here's one of those experts, Harry Hursty, tweeting, that there were, there were no packet captures presented to us, zero. The claim was that Lindell was going to give them internet packet captures that uh, were absolute proof. He used really astonishing language like that. Absolute proof of tampering in our election. And there were no packet captures. Hursty and other experts who went there left empty-handed. And in fact, they even tried to, to um, say bad things about Hursty and others who were saying, Dude, I came here, you gave me nothing, you have nothing, you have no proof. And yet, in, rather than, anyway, the whole thing was a mess. But to make a long story short, there is absolutely no evidence that there was tampering in the 2020 election. Instead, what we know is that it was quite seriously the most tightly run election, probably in the history of the country, which is an astonishing statement. I'm not saying there isn't more work to do, what I'm saying is we had a pretty good election. The outcome is not in dispute by anybody who knows how elections work. So we're going to take a quick break. So everybody go have a cup of tea and get ready for one or two slides that have <gasps> math on them. Not too much, just a little. And so when we return from our break, I'm going to be telling all of you about some techniques and tools and technologies that we can use to make better, more secure, more transparent elections. Be right back. Okay, folks, we're just going to take a, just a quick break just to make sure that, uh, that everything is um, synced up the way it should be, but we should be back uh, any minute. It's always been so nice, Aaron, for you to tell everybody why we're taking this break, so maybe you want to do that. Sure thing. So mainly the reason we do it is after a while when we have uh, videos playing over Zoom, they tend to desync. Um, usually it could be the user's connection, it could be the, the source connection from you know where I am. Um, and so what we do is we just uh, we give the video, we split it in twos. Um, this one's 15 minutes and then the next one's about 20 minutes. And that allows things to uh, to be nice and smooth, so that um, we don't have any of that weird desync where you hear sound and you see a mouth moving later on, or vice versa. Um, it's really disconcerting when you see it. So um, to negate that, we need to try to do a little break. Um, but we shouldn't have to take much longer. I think we should be good to go. So I'll go ahead and start the second part. Will we have an opportunity to ask questions? Yes, you will, after the talk. Yes. 
this is Ken Maddox. I have a technical question about our society. Uh, normally, I and a lot of other people pay their meal ticket and their annual dues at the meeting. Uh, we've been a little bit uh, abnormal this year. So can you tell us exactly how the Houston Philosophical Society wants us to handle our financial responsibilities. Oh, if you can, well, we've sent out some emails. If you can mail a check-in to uh, Dale Wilkins, we'll send it out again, the address. And if you'll mail a check with your dues to Dale Wilkins, we would appreciate it. Um, and credit we're, card, we're trying card. to get, excuse me? Credit card. You know, right now we can't do that. We're trying to get um, electronic payment set up, but apparently the bank we work with is sort of a 19th century bank and they don't do that. So check, um, check, check. Right now a check is, is uh, the only means. But we're on it. We'll have some other opportunities for payments in, in a month probably. Yes. I'll go ahead and restart. Houston Philosophical Society, welcome back to the second part of my talk. So in the first half, I spoke to you about some, a brief history of some of the recent excitement in American elections. Today, I'm going to be talking now in the second part of my talk about how we can build better elections. What technologies and science and math and cryptography and engineering can do to give us better election technology. And so I'm going to start this story with a project that began at Microsoft. This was announced in 2019. Microsoft announced an open source election guard system, a software development kit to help build secure democratic elections. And so today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about how that works. This is built on ideas that go all the way back to the late 1980s. And a, so a lot of my research in the past two decades has been in this area. I'm not going to give you the full history. Instead, I'm going to jump right into some current topics in building secure election systems. So why do I care about cryptography and voting? So one of the cool things that we can do is called end-to-end -end cryptography. What's that? This is, this is the only equation today, so don't panic. If you think about a ballot, a ballot is a series of bubbles that a, that a voter fills in or doesn't fill in. So you can pretend that those are ones and zeros. And so then we can encrypt those ones or zeros. So the notation here, E sub K of A, is encrypt with a key K, the value A. And one of the cool things that we can do is if we encrypt a ballot, we have this option called an additive homomorphism. This operation allows us to take two encrypted numbers, do a thing, and then we get out the same result as if we had decrypted, added, and then encrypted again. Why is this relevant or interesting? Well, this lets us, the encryption system that we're using is called asymmetric. That means that anybody can encrypt, but only the election official can decrypt. And that means that a voter can have, can keep a copy of their encrypted vote. They can leave the polling place with a copy of their encrypted vote. That's really valuable. That means that the voter can then go and look at what's called a public bulletin board, just think a website of some sort, and they can see, yup, there's my vote. Here's my copy, there's their copy, the bits are the same. And that means that a voter can gain some assurance that their vote will be tallied identical to the way they cast it. That you have a, a degree of radical transparency in how the election is tabulated because you can prove in a mathematical sense 
that your vote was correctly tabulated in the total. That, that's amazing. That's part of what we're trying to do. There are many other cool features, and if I had an hour, I'd run through all of them, but I'm keeping it short. And what I'll tell you is that every one of those encrypted counters includes a cryptographic proof, like in the sense of a mathematical proof, that each of those numbers that's encrypted is either a zero or a one, but definitely not anything else. And through that and other related proofs that we can include with a ballot, any observer can look at all of the millions of ballots and prove mathematically that none of those ballots are encrypting a huge number. The numbers are either zero or one. And that means that you don't have to worry that some sneaky computer or person snuck in a malformed ballot to tamper with the election outcome. So you can't do sneaky ballot stuffing kinds of attacks. Um, and at the end of the day, when the election officials add this all up, they produce another proof that the way, the, when they announce the totals, candidate A got this many votes, candidate B got that many votes, A is the winner, they produce another proof that those totals that they announced are consistent with something that everybody can compute, which is the encrypted total. So any observer can do all of this math, and then the observer can convince themselves that the outcome is correct. Now, are you going to do that? Is, you know, who's going to do all of this math? Um, the short answer is, Probably your local newspaper, the League of Women Voters, uh, the political parties, people who, who have a serious interest in the correct outcome will invest the effort, hire a consultant perhaps, and you know, temporarily allocate uh, thousands of computers on Amazon to do this expensive cryptographic computation. And then the, the Houston Chronicle newspaper the next day will say, our experts analyze the results and they're good. So if you don't trust the Houston Chronicle, your political party might, might do the same analysis, the League of Women Voters can do the same analysis. It's all public, anybody can do the math. It's computationally expensive, but you can rent computers for Amazon for seven cents an hour, and so you can rent a thousand computers and go a thousand times faster. That's part of the stuff that I've been working on, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, there are a lot of ways to not do this sort of cryptography. Um, in Switzerland, fun fact, something like 40% of Swiss voters live outside of the borders of Switzerland. People live all over the place, mostly in Europe. But when 40% of your voters are outside of your country, you need to do something interesting. And so traditionally, this has been the job of the Swiss post office, Swiss post, and they decided to have a an electronic online voting system using similar kinds of cryptography. And turns out they got the cryptography wrong. And so the, here are two different research papers posted by several experts in the field saying how they got the math wrong and you could fake the proofs and do a number of other things. So getting these cryptographic systems correct is not a trivial thing. So then the question you should ask is, will Election Guard do better? Right? This is the thing that talented researchers from Microsoft, I'm involved in it, a number of really sharp people, including one of the co-authors of one of those papers I just showed you, are helping Microsoft to do this correctly. The source code is all public. You can download it today on GitHub. And they've also just recently announced that Hardener Civic, the very same company that supplied both our old voting system in Houston and our brand new voting system in Houston. Picture it on the right. Hard Inner Civic has announced a partnership with Microsoft. Exactly what they're going to ship to whom and when has not yet been announced in public, but the latest news from June was that Hart and Microsoft are working together to take this election guard stuff and make it real. And Boy, I would, I would love, I would adore for them to do a trial in Houston. But generally speaking, 
people who are trying out new election technologies like to do it in smaller places with smaller number of votes where if something goes wrong, it's bad, but it's not catastrophic. But anyway, election guards, the, the business model here is that Microsoft is doing a good thing for the world by building this open source free thing. And Microsoft is building a technology that a vendor like Hard Inner Civic can adopt at minimal cost to them. So Microsoft is doing a lot of the engineering heavy lifting and then vendors like Hart can adopt it and improve the security of their systems. So I should point out that this is not an online voting system. Even though the previous thing I mentioned in Switzerland is mathematically very closely related to Election Guard, Election Guard was never meant to be used online. Even though it's the same math, it's the same cryptography. And the reason why is that having you vote from home is a completely different experience from voting in a polling place. When you're voting in a polling place, that computer that's staring you in the face can have some controls. Not just anybody is allowed to install software on that computer. And we can imagine auditing and testing procedures to make sure that when I punch in Alice for president, Bob for Senate, Charlie for governor. When I hit print, and not just a voter, an auditor can be conducting this auditing process to make sure that the voting machine is working accurately and correctly. And even in the middle of an election, an auditor might discover that a voting machine is misbehaving and take some sort of corrective action. We have, and on top of all of that, there is a paper ballot. There might be some fancy cryptography happening in the background, but the existence of paper ballots means that no nation state adversary from some other country can reach in through the internet and tamper with paper that's been printed. Instead, we can have a chain of custody, we can have physical storage, locked gates, guns, guards, all of that stuff to make sure that no matter what goes wrong on the electronic side, that we have a paper side to fall back on. This is a really important distinction, that Election Guard helps us, helps us verify an election. It was correct, but if the Election Guard proofs don't check out, if the numbers don't add up, we still have to be able to figure out who won, and Election Guard is built around a model where we still have old-fashioned ink on paper. I will say that we're working on a really interesting form of vote by mail where you might run something like Election Guard inside of your web browser and then the results would be printed on paper and you'd mail them back. That's particularly interesting for people for whom travel to a polling place might be difficult, uh, perhaps because they have a disability or perhaps because we're living in, I don't know, a global respiratory pandemic perhaps. But nonetheless, we can do the fancy cryptography with paper ballots through the mail. So that's something we're working on right now. So I should take a brief digression and tell you about another cool election technology called a risk limiting audit. This was pioneered about a decade ago by a statistician from the University of California. And the idea is that computers are super fast and awesome at counting things, but computers are fragile and hackable. People, on the other hand, are really robust against hacking. We don't know how to reach across the internet and hack your brain. Not well, anyway. Uh, but people are, so people can count things, but they're slow and inefficient. Computers are quick and, quick and, and dirty. People are slow and accurate. So um, the idea of a risk-limiting audit <clears throat> The risk that we want to limit is the risk that any error in the computation is smaller than the margin of victory. We're trying to limit the risk that we announce the wrong winner of an election because of some hypothetical error in the electronic tabulation. So what we do is we sample the paper ballots. We literally roll dice, you know, choose your color of 10-sided dice, widely available, cheap, on the internet, if you've ever played Dungeons and Dragons, you've dealt with these kinds of dice. The, you roll some dice and then that 
um, tells us which ballots we're going to pull from the warehouse. And then we might need to touch tens at most hundreds of ballots. And we compare them to the electronic results, and they had better be the same. If they are different in any way, then we haven't met the risk limit, and we therefore we need to sample more. In the worst case, it devolves to a manual recount of the whole election. But if everything is going well, in an afternoon, we can audit the election and say something like, with 95% confidence, we have the correct winner of the election. In an efficient process that many election officials around the world are now starting to use. One of the things that I've been involved in is trying to improve these risk limiting audits using the very same cryptography that I described as part of the election guard project. Let me try to explain the problem. The number of ballots you have to sample depends on the margin of victory. If they're, as the race gets tighter and tighter and tighter, our margin of error gets, gets smaller and smaller. Like we can tolerate less error in a tight election without changing who won. So therefore, we need to sample more ballots to convince ourselves we have the right winner. But what if the computer that added up the ballots and told us the margin of victory was lying? That, that would be really bad. So what if the claimed margin is big, the actual margin is small? And for that matter, what if the people who are doing the audit are also putting on a show, and you might be able to put on a show more easily if you have to make fewer draws? So we can use the very same cryptography to improve the security of a risk-limiting audit. And the mechanism is that we want to commit every ballot. And we do that by encrypting every single ballot and posting them online. And doing this means that an election official can prove in a mathematically strong way that they're not cheating. So this idea was first roughed out in a paper in only 2019. And my project for 2020 was building it. I was on sabbatical for calendar year 2020. And I was working from home for a startup in the election space called Voting Works. They're a not-for-profit. And they build risk-limiting audit systems. And they build voting systems. And my job for 2020 was to build this cryptographic auditing thing. And in fact, we even did a pilot of it in Inyo County, California. You can see that's on the eastern side of the state. You can see the highlighted uh, rectangle there. Inyo County is a relatively small county because that's how you do pilots. So we ran just under 10,000 ballots and had the first ever verifiable risk-limiting audit. Um, this was done alongside a regular risk-limiting audit that they were conducting as standard operating procedure in this county. And all of the code that I built in 2020, it's all online and you can check it out. And I could easily spend the next hour telling you how much fun I had making it go fast because I needed to, and you know, for 10,000 ballots, you can run that on your PC. I was not engineering for this. I was engineering for city of Houston, Harris County. I wanted to run, I wanted to be able to scale to millions of ballots and still do this computation in an hour or two. That's ongoing work to make it go faster and faster will tend to use thousands of computers that we rent from Amazon. So I want to wrap up with a little bit of perspective, or try to wrap up with some perspective. So OK, we have technologies for really good voting verification. We have technologies for good election audits. We're good? Well, one of the things that I'm very concerned about is voter registration data. You know, these are stored on computers, and those computers can be tampered like any other computer. And this is particularly a concern in the world of early voting and election day vote centers, which we now have in Houston. You can go vote anywhere you want. You don't have to just vote at your home precinct. So having choice is great. Voters love it. But that means we need to have a database that keeps track of which voters have voted and which voters have not voted. That database is, has to be online so we can check you off. The security of that database is something that I would like to see more attention being paid to. So far, not enough. These end-to-end -end voting schemes like I described, they're mathematical beauties. 
and we're starting to see pilot elections, but I think we're still years and years away from this kind of technology being in mainstream widespread use. And I want to make sure that I wrap up by saying two things. The first thing I want to say is internet voting is a really, really bad idea. If you're worried about a foreign nation state adversary who doesn't care about following norms and good procedures and just wants to mess with your election, internet voting is a really bad idea. And despite all of that, I also need to wrap up and say we have absolutely no credible evidence of any systemic election fraud in 2020. We know how to do elections a lot better than we did in 2020. I still have many security concerns about how elections operate in this country, but that's not inconsistent with saying that nothing went terribly wrong in 2020. We have the correct winner in the White House. And with that, I'd like to throw it open to questions. Thank you all very much. Well, so before we uh, start with questions, um, Kathleen Boyd, the president-elect of HPS, posted the information on the dues in the chat. So if you want to uh, copy that out, you just open your chat. And now for questions. Anne McNaughton has her hand up. Oops. And I'm not, or did I, um, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, I, yes, I'm curious to know where to go online to find any of your research or any of the resources that you mentioned to understand better. Boy, where to begin? Um, <laughs> I'm an academic, which means of course I have a homepage. And if you type Dan Wallach to your favorite search engine, you'll find my homepage and there are links to all of my publications. If you want to learn more about Election Guard, you can search for that. And Microsoft has a number of web pages that describe how it works. Um, honestly, it's if you want to get into the mathematical nuts and bolts, then, you know, it's not the sort of thing that's just a casual afternoon read. It's, you know, like a lot of work. Um, and part of the challenge that we face is finding ways to take all these sophisticated techniques and simplify them or hide them to the point where most voters don't need to know that they're even there, yet they're still helping protect the election. That's making this, the highly secure systems also be highly usable is an open challenge that we're still working on. Thank you. Evelyn has her hand up. Uh, Ken Maddox here. I am a surgeon over at Baylor. Um, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, I, I, I play the internet. I uh, have websites, uh, but uh, your level of uh, Sophistication is many quantums ahead of mine. However, you have reinstated a basic word for people to work together, and that is trust. You have convinced me that I can trust the system. So my question to you is, will this new computer sophistication with all the software you have introduced, how do we educate the public to increase trust um, and not have more skepticism. So there's a challenge that you face in the medical world, convincing people to get a vaccine that works versus using a veterinary deworming product that does nothing. We, there, there's a similar thing in the election world, which is that we need to convince people that election officials are actually really good at tabulating elections and that we have a lot of experience in the nuts and bolts of managing elections. And in fact, our election officials are really good at what they do. Actually, a really thankless job. They, they take a ton of crap from people who don't know what they're talking about. And it's many good election officials are retiring or leaving the field. So misinformation and disinformation 
are a huge problem today in the election space. Can sophisticated cryptographic systems address misinformation is like saying, can sophisticated mRNA vaccines address anti-vaccination misinformation? And I wish the answer was yes, but I'm afraid that, that we have a, a broader problem in terms of public education and trusting science. I'm not saying that you need to trust the scientist. I'm saying that you need to trust the science, you know, that and you don't have to trust, you know, odds are you aren't going to run this math on your computer. Somebody else is going to do it and they're going to tell you, I ran it and it works. So you still have to trust somebody to speak truth to you. And when the people who you trust aren't telling you the truth, that's where things break down. And that's where I don't think science has the answers to the problems that we face necessarily in the space. I think that also answers a typed in question from Virginia. Um, Evelyn has her hand up, Evelyn. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, well, I think this is very interesting because it, uh, it certainly does seem to solve or go close to solving problems like hanging chads and increase, uh, increase confidence in what you called and what we call systemic election fraud. I understand that's where Trump brought his challenge was to systemic election fraud in the machines and was thrown out by every court. I haven't seen any of the petitions, but as a four time elected state official, that's not my experience of voter fraud at all. It has absolutely nothing to do with whether the machines work. It has to do with where the ballots came from and how they got into the machine. Did they get into the machine? And I happen to have personal experience that says it sure does happen because one of my opponents in my four elections had a petition, his, his petition was signed with all the required names, all in the same hand. I chose not to sue him because I knew I was gonna win because I personally am 100% opposed to partisan judicial elections in the first place. I think it's a terrible way to do it. But that's the way it was, and it's the way it still is. But the problem is a real one, and that is, is not systemic election fraud via machine, but uh, absolute deliberate voter fraud by partisans using the same techniques that Texas is now trying to, to clean up its laws against, not requiring voter ID not checking your voting rolls to be sure that the people who are voting are alive, sending out mailed ballots to the entire county, which I can understand the reason for it in COVID. Ordinarily, I cannot. And I think Texas is absolutely right to reinstate ballots that uh, you have to request and you have to be in a certain category to do it because it's an open invitation for ballot harvesting and ballot harvesting is absolutely real. And when I hear that this, <laughs> the election was absolutely perfect, I believe you from the systemic election fraud side, the machine side, where the question arises is with practices that raise serious questions about what got into the machine in the first place. And every one of these types of schemes depends on not, um, uh, oh mm. gee, I'm losing my train of thought, I'm getting too old. It, on not having any evidence. You destroy the evidence. The ballot is counted by the malfeasing party fed into the machine by that party, by the official, who, for example, may be keeping the other party officials out of there, may be counting these in the middle of the night, may have picked them up from a drop box that's out in the, at the end of the world and it had carefully had ballots fed into it. So how do you stop that? Because that is a, that's where it is. It's a serious problem. It's not 
uh, it, it's not Trump derangement syndrome, pro or con. It is a real problem and it can change elections. I happen to believe it has not changed any, um, any Texas elections that I'm aware of. Uh, I don't think it has, but it- I, I can definitely well speak to out. some of these concerns. Um, the one thing that we know in terms of like people charged with crimes involves, uh, you were used the phrase ballot harvesting. This is typically done in nursing homes. Oh yeah, where, it sure is. And, and, and that's the, something the, else my, my opponent did was right, go so, to the local neighborhood nursing home. Let me explain how it works. The bridge too. But let me explain how it works. I'm on it. I got you. So okay. the way that the way that this sort of attack works is that we have people living in nursing homes or otherwise unable to cast their votes in person and postal mail ballots are intercepted by staff who work at the nursing home who are often underpaid and underappreciated and then they can sell those blank ballots in bulk to and there's a this there are a number of words for the people who do the harvesting <laughs> most the, of them probably aren't nice well there's a lovely spanish english mashup word that comes to us from the rio grande valley called if i get this right votiqueros which are the people who, who, who round up these votes. And people have been charged with crimes on this. So that's absolutely a real concern. And I also need to say that a lot of the things that you face as a candidate are some shady character comes up to you and says, give me a bunch of money and I will arrange for a couple thousand votes like this to show up in your favor. So this happens more in local political races than it does at state or national level. But these are definitely issues and people have been charged with crimes on these issues. So this kind of fraud is definitely a real thing. But mm -hmm. many of the things that people are accusing as being modes of fraud, dead people voting, people voting multiple times, uh, ballot box stuffing, are pure fiction. There's absolutely no factual basis to say that dead people are voting. And there's no factual basis to say that postal ballots are more fraudulent than in-person ballots. We have other states like Oregon and Washington state where 100% of their ballots are cast by mail. And nobody's accusing Oregon and Washington state of being fraudulent. It's just simply false. They uh, luckily, have those are one party states. Well, you'd think so, but you'd also be wrong. If you go to parts of Eastern Oregon and compare that to parts of rural Texas, the politics are very similar. The difference is that Oregon is majority Democratic and Texas is majority Republican. So the state governments reflect that in their policies, but the populations are actually quite a bit more diverse in both Texas and Oregon. But see, but, the problem is that the ballot itself disappears that's where your evidence would be right and so this is where the cryptographic techniques come into play the cryptographic techniques give you a degree of proof that your ballot was unmolested through its path from when you finished voting till when it was tabulated at the end and you personally can prove mathematically or you can delegate to somebody else to, to do the work on your behalf that your vote was correctly tabulated that's a big deal. So I'm not saying that we're going to solve all these problems, especially since a, sub a substantial number of them are pure fiction, but we can nonetheless increase our transparency. We can increase the degree that somebody from outside the elections office can look in in a mathematical way and prove that the office of the election administrator operated in a proper fashion. One other thing I want to briefly mention uh, something I find unfortunate in Texas is that election administration is often another partisan office holder. Just as you mentioned, wouldn't it be nice if judges weren't partisan? I think I would also say, wouldn't it be nice if election administrators weren't partisan? Exactly. And exactly. New Jersey, of all places, has a solution to this that I love. In New Jersey, you have, they, they go in pairs. You've got the Republican and the Democrat. 
and they walk around together and they do everything together. So there's two, everywhere you would have one person, you have two people. And so it's their job to be adversarial to each other all the time. I like that. <laughs> And so, I don't know how you could make it work, but it sounds like a good idea. I guess well, New Jersey knows how to do it. Well, New Jersey has its other issues. I, I went to grad school there. I have, I have things I can complain about. But what I'll tell you is that, you know, we can, sometimes you can solve the problem through nonpartisanship. Sometimes you can solve the problem through bipartisanship. You know, there's more than one way to address trust in election officials. Dan, I have a question for you. Thank you. Um, if you were given the task of setting up a, re a congressional redistricting system, cool. what would that look like? So now we get into the exciting world of gerrymandering. How do you draw maps? Um, I teach a voting class once every two years with Bob Stein, who's a political scientist, and Mike Byrne, who's a psychologist who does usability. So you, know, you can write the jokes. A computer scientist, a psychologist, and a political scientist walk into a bar. That's us. Anyway. Um, when we're talking about, so I put together an entire hour long lecture on gerrymandering and how it works. And it's a, it's another whole branch of mathematics for how people study gerrymandering, both how you can quantify how bad it is and how you can quantify like this is a good map or this is a bad map. There are metrics and heuristics that people have come up with that can give a number. So you can say this districting is, you know, like th there's a metric that was used in a Supreme Court lawsuit called uh, excess vote or wasted vote. I forget the exact wording. The idea is that if you are a Democrat living in, um, okay, forget, forget, forget party labels. There are two techniques that you use when you're an evil malicious gerrymanderer. Technique, and these are called packing and cracking. So if I have a party that I don't like, the way that I take their votes away from them is I either create districts that are like 80, 90% of that party. So every vote beyond 50% is a vote that's wasted. If the candidate's already won. So that's called packing. The alternative, cracking, I take an area where there's a whole bunch of people of one political party and I slice them up like a pie. So if you look at the Texas map, and you look at Austin, which is a strongly democratic area, the districting, the, there are people who live in Austin who are part of districts that go way out halfway to Houston. That's cracking. And that dilutes the political power of people who live inside Austin. The way that, I mean, one simple metric is you look at the total number of congressional votes for Democrats, total number of congressional votes for Republicans, if you do that in Texas, you'll see the Republicans are like up, but not up like a lot. They're up by a little. So the congressional delegation in total should reflect that when in fact the congressional delegation is heavily lopsided. And so Texas is a lopsided state. Other ones like Wisconsin is actually much, much worse in how they're and how lopsided they are. And trying to come up with legal standards to battle this is an ongoing problem that I don't have. What I will say is that some states, not including Texas, have declared that there must be nonpartisan map making. California is doing this, others are doing this, where the maps are drawn by nonpartisan committees, which really means bipartisan, and they all have to agree and it avoids the smoky back room problem, which is where these awful maps like we have in Texas, where they come from. It's an open done. challenge. Uh, I see a hand up, Richard. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm Nicola. I'm using my Nicola. computer. Um, hi, Dr. Wallach. Um, a question for you as a follow-up to the gerrymandering. With your knowledge of technology, do you think it would be possible to use something like the technology that Google Maps does for grids to draw districts based on that same grid technology where you would have small, you know, in places like Houston where you have dense populations, districts, you know, based on smaller squares. And then out in West Texas, you'd have, you know, 
you know, more of the little squares, bigger square to make up a district. Do you think that's, you know, and barring the legal issues that we face in Texas with the, you know, no district can go over a county line. And there's also some civil rights issues you have to consider when you're drawing maps. Um, but barring those two things, do you think that technology could work as a workaround for this gerrymandering? Um, you're not going to solve a technical, you're not going to solve a legal problem with a technical algorithm of any kind. If what we have is a legal situation where the people who control the government can draw the maps to advantage themselves, then they will. No, I get that. That's not my question. My question is whether or not the technology would actually work. Assuming that you could get, and I, I know that's a big leap, right? It's a big leap to get the politicians, right. you know, if and human nature to, not to buy if themselves. Right. If your goal is to draw fair maps, the way that people, so there's a research group in Tufts, it calls it something. There are several research groups around the country. There's even a professor at Rice who works on this, Ilya Hicks in the CAM department. The mathematics of drawing fair maps is reasonably well understood and it's also computationally expensive. But you get your big computer to grind away and you can get, you can define metrics for what you mean by fair. So fairness actually is three separate properties. One of them is compactness, that districts should not be these enormous blobs. Like I live in the second congressional district, that's Dan Crenshaw, and it's this crazy hook-shaped thing that starts in the med center and winds its way in a giant snaky thing all around the city and ends up in Kingwood somewhere. So that's sort of the opposite of a compact district. Another property you might want is competitiveness, that you want the, the election within a district to be close, as opposed to having it be a blowout in either direction. So, and then a, a third property you, you might want is a, a, a more global property, which is this thing I said before, where you want the total number of seats in this, from the state delegation to reflect the total number of votes cast for each party. So compactness, competitiveness, and that third one is often called fairness. And getting all three of these properties at the same time from the same map actually turns out to be really difficult. Um, you don't tend to do it in terms of grids, you do it in terms of precincts, or what the political scientists would call boxes, but they're not actually rectangular. They're, you know, little chunks uh, on, the, on the map, you know, like, I live in the Southgate neighborhood, so you might draw a little map, and that's, that's an atomic box. And then you've got this giant puzzle grid across the state, where in Houston, the boxes are, might be small. In Lubbock, the boxes might be bigger. It doesn't matter the size of the box. What matters is the number of people in the box. And then it's a gigantic computational graph, and you're trying to partition the graph to satisfy some properties. This is a thing that you can set your computer to it and it can grind away and you can you can say I care more about compactness. I care more about competitiveness. I care more about overall fairness. And sometimes there are legal constraints as well, where um, there are certain laws that require you to deliberately draw districts in a way that advantages uh, a minority population that otherwise would have no representation. So Sometimes you, you're willing to deliberately compromise on competitiveness because you have a legal requirement to. So nothing is simple in the world of, of drawing fair maps. It's, it's quite a complicated endeavor. Thank you. So um, before we go back to Evelyn, who has her hand up again, I believe, John Beach has a typed in question <clears throat> on the issue of ballot harvesting, is there a way to selectively choose a subset of the encrypted ballots and reach out to those voters to get them to confirm their identity and legitimacy? So it turns out one of the most important properties of our elections is the anonymity of the voter, where we deliberately engineer our elections in a way that a voter cannot choose they, they cannot decide to show how they voted to a third party. Like it's, it, there is no feasible way for you to prove to somebody else that you vote for who you say you did. And that's actually based on history. Because if you go back about a hundred years, back to the, the era of 
of women's suffrage. Back then, you didn't necessarily have a secret ballot. Um, you didn't even have standardized paper sheets that you filled in. The, the, that was an, uh, an invention in Australia in the 1850s. And by the 1890s, 1900s, it was starting in the US. But instead, you would have like a piece of paper printed by your party, the party slate. So you're, you're standing there with a blue piece of paper or a red piece of paper. And people could tell who you were going to vote for by looking at you standing in line. And it created a, an unpleasant atmosphere. Let's just leave it at that. And one of the things that the suffragettes were pushing for, in addition to the right to vote, was the right to vote privately. That way, you couldn't be coerced or bribed into voting in a particular way. That is an essential property. And anything we do with elections has to respect voter privacy. True. So, and, and so that's why, in this case, the, the ballots are encrypted. So I'm not asking at all about what your vote was. I'm saying, hey, you did cast a vote. Are you who you say you are? And can we verify that you cast a vote? And can you please run through and verify that the vote matches what you cast? So in other words, I would have no idea how you voted, but I could confirm that you are legitimately the voter. And if there was any issue with fraud in the case of ballot harvesting, you potentially by you know, randomly selecting across all the votes, at some point you're gonna run into a pile of votes that came from a certain you know, pile. If you begin to detect anything that looks like fraud, then you could zero in on the rest of them. And yet you have not at all betrayed the voters trust or in any way revealed their vote. So some of the things you're talking about are contradictory or not terribly well specified. like. Here's a very real problem. Not every voter has a driver's license. I mean, I realize you have one, I have one, but not everybody does. Not every voter has a birth certificate. I have one, you have one, but try getting one for somebody who's over 75, especially if they were born at home in a rural area. So it's actually a lot harder than you'd think to manage voter identity. So never mind saying, can you verify that you voted? It's what evidence do you have that you are a US citizen actually is harder than you'd think. So Which there sounds are like some, a pretty important problem to solve. You'd think it is, mm -hmm. yet it's actually, we have been running elections for the entire history of this country with less than perfect evidence of citizenship. And nobody has accused non-citizens of voting. There's no credible evidence that this is a problem. There's, you know, histrionic complaints, but no credible evidence that this is a problem that requires outrageous effort to solve. But this would, this would indicate if that was a problem, right? I mean, like you say, it's hard for someone to prove that they're a citizen, but I thought we wanted to restrict this voting to citizens. And if that's the case, then they do need to have some kind of some way to verify that they're a citizen. Otherwise, the whole world can vote. Well, so the, the process of registering to vote is real work and they make it harder and harder all the time. And like I said, you know it, it's unclear that we have hordes of Russians streaming into our voter registration system. Like there's just no evidence that that's happening. So even though you're expressing a concern, there's no evidence that it's a problem. So it's a weird thing that we should invest time, money, and energy to solve a thing that is not actually a problem. I mean, yeah, we can. I mean, I'll tell you the Mexican solution. You'll love this. In Mexico, I want to hear this. The, 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 the ID card that is most likely to be in a Mexican citizen's pocket is their voter registration card. And just like in the US, your social security number is used for a million things that have nothing to do with your retirement. It's just sort of this universal number that gets attached to you. In Mexico, your voter ID number is the thing that gets attached to you. 
and gets used for a million things that have nothing to do with your actual voting in Mexican elections. So I could see that we could have a national ID card, but once you say that, the federal government has tried to improve standards for 50 states driver's licenses. It's called real ID. Some of my driver's license, there's a little gold star that says that I jumped through 10 hoops to get my driver's license. And apparently now it's hard to get on airplanes if you don't have a real ID license. And you should be aware that there was a huge kerfuffle about real ID standards. And states were like, we don't want to be forced to improve our ID just because the federal government tells us so. There's always, when you start talking about ID cards and requirements, then inevitably you run into a problem where there's going to be somebody who doesn't have the requirement to get the ID card that you thought everybody can get. You know, maybe that person is not who you think. Maybe it's somebody in a nursing home. Maybe it's a nun or a monk who is sort of outside of the normal system, doesn't drive, doesn't do anything. Especially it might, might be somebody over 75 where it's incredibly difficult just to document their birth or anything else. It's when you start saying everybody can do this, what's the problem? You're missing a lot of people when you say everybody. You're well, assuming actually, everybody. I didn't can say do that, but but okay. Looks like Evie has a comment or a question. You mute it. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, gerrymandering. That. Um, I, I agree with you, that is a gigantic problem. It is really, really wrong. But my recollection is, and I have not read this case, and I, it's one of the things on my to-do list, I intend to, I believe a couple of years ago, given the opportunity to ban that and take it away, take the um, drawing of districts away from the parties, the Supreme Court expressly decided to leave it with the parties. Is that right? Well, yeah. you do that, and you're going to get gerrymandering. And one of the worst things, unfortunately, I was wondering if I'd say this, but I am going to say it. An unintended, I think a lot of people have said this, an unintended consequence of the Voting Rights Act was to increase race-based voting, to put the people who were protected classes into compact districts, which was an open invitation to go out and gerrymander around them do some more race-based voting. And uh, personally, I would love to see the grid plunked down. I, I think it was very interesting that you had some ways of, um, of suggesting that. I think it would really help polarize, yeah, uh, uh, break down some of this polarization. And I know that there are electoral experts from across the political spectrum, in fact, who, who have thought the same thing. So thanks yeah. for bringing that up. So Indeed, there was a court case just a couple years ago where Roberts writing for the majority. Uh, this, this case concerned the Wisconsin gerrymandering, and they had some of the best political scientists coming up with uh, metrics for measuring uh, how lopsided the districts were. And they said, they said, here are millions of districts across the country and you know based on that the the wisconsin districts are among the worst and you know based on these numbers that we can Fine. quantify and roberts basically said eh. so for better or for worse now it's becoming a, a 50 states issue many states have constitutions that have wording about fair elections and oftentimes the wording in those state constitutions is actually not very specific on this question and so lawsuits are happening in state Supreme Courts or working through the state court system that state by state, people are pushing for fair maps. Hmm. How is this going to shake out in the long term? I don't know. It's, I mean, there's another, I mean, while we're on the topic of things that have nothing to do with my research expertise, there's a whole other thing about um, re-enfranchising felons who've completed their prison yep. terms, you know? Yep. Everyone and, and and but wait, there's more. When you're when you're a felon in prison, who gets to count your body towards like 
representation. You know, like, do, do, do you count as a, as a voter for representation where you used to live? Or do you count as a voter for representation where you're incarcerated and not allowed to vote? So there's a lot of really interesting corner cases when you start asking legal questions about gerrymandering. Fascinating. Hope to hear more from you on this one of these days. Thank you very much for that. Oh yeah, we could we could do a whole extra hour on gerrymandering. <laughs> May I ask you a question about uh, about voting in Harris County? Uh, I was uh, an election judge and precinct chairman for 25 years, and and saw a lot of progress in the voting apparatus, the technology, made it more secure and faster. Uh, it, do you have a driver's license? Do you have some kind of ID? There's a lot of different IDs we'll accept all the way down to electric bill statements and things. So I, I don't think that people are kept from voting. We even do provisional voting. Somebody is in the wrong place and they, but we, we let them vote. And then that's that satisfied at the, at the county level later, whether they count the vote or not. But I don't think people have had difficulty over the last 25 years in Harris County in voting. We have 500 places to vote in Harris County. We have, we have like in the precinct I was responsible for, we have 3,500 uh, voters and about 60 to 70 percent always voted and generally a thousand to two thousand voted in person so they're very incentivized because they're educated they are, are aware of what what's happening and they care about their homes and what happens to their home and their communities and when we had the democrats and republicans voting together we always had in every precinct we had both parties at the table that that is usual and customary in Harris County. So to say that it's only one sided, it's not it's not accurate. We always had. Uh, and when you had the Democrats voting separately from the Republicans, it was in the same room. And we usually had 12 voting machines, which is an awful lot. But that's because we had you qualified it based on volume of voters. So this last election, when the county judge switched everything around to the point that the state came in and changed these voting laws to stop her from undoing everything to where people didn't know where they were, it was very confusing. Then it's gotten re-centered to where it was more secure before we had these massive changes in Harris County. Now that's gonna go back. I think that the voting is gonna be a lot safer and more secure in the future and people are gonna like it because they won't have any questions about if, if you're trying to uh, defraud the election, you're gonna to go to jail. In fact, an election judge has the power of, of, a county, of, of a county official. They can have you arrested if you're in messing with a voter in, in a voting uh, booth. So I, I think Harris County is gonna benefit from these new clean up the act activities and you'll see a better election across the state going forward. So I have mixed opinions about this. I don't, um, but I don't know how you could. Well, it's, it's my job to have mixed opinions. So I think that I, I, when I first started at Rice in 1998, you know, we were voting on punch cards. And then in after it turns out punch cards have this hanging Chad problem among other issues, in 2001, we bought these paperless electronic voting machines. I was part of a team where the state of California did an analysis and we found a huge number of security vulnerabilities. Those e-slates were a terrible design, but nonetheless, we didn't ever seem to have a huge security problem with them, which is, uh, amazes me because they were very poorly engineered, but they're gone. We're never gonna be voting on them ever again. The new systems that we're getting use paper and it's, it's a touchscreen contraption that produces a printed paper ballot. It's a massive improvement over where we used to be in terms of the technology. Um, you're right that Harris County does, takes its bipartisanship seriously. And you know, as we have transitioned from a Republican county clerk to a Democratic county clerk, 
and a Republican uh, tax assessor collector to a Democratic tax assessor collector. It's been smooth and transparent. I don't think we've seen huge procedural or policy changes. The, the changes in the 2020 election specifically, I thought were actually fantastic. And I think you're mischaracterizing them. So 24 hour voting was a huge step up. It allowed, it, it increased the franchise. It made it easier for people who work weird hours to cast votes. I think the drive through voting was a great idea because in a world where we were still learning how this pandemic virus worked and nobody was vaccinated yet, not having to leave your car and still being able to vote was a great idea. So I think that those changes were fantastic. And I find the state's new law to be appalling. I am embarrassed at some of the new state laws that have that, that were passed recently. I think they're completely irrational and there's no I need to stop here. They're bad laws. <laughs> well, voting, voting 24 hours never made sense. It's dangerous. I strongly to, disagree with you. Voting 24 people, hours makes perfect have, sense. Have, have, okay, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. We don't want to get in a political argument here, this which is political. sort of what this is devolving into. It's and unfortunate. I, yeah, like, <clears throat> don't get me stirred on this stuff. Um, I think we should thank our speaker for a fascinating talk and obviously lively discussion afterwards and thank uh, Maria Lynn again for the violin recital and let our speaker go off and have some dinner. Um, <laughs> normally dinner precedes the, the meeting at the Cohen house and unfortunately we're in this zoom world. Uh, maybe that won't last too much longer. So let's thank our speaker and maybe call it a night. What do you think? All right. Thank you all very much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Sonia. And hopefully I'll see all you people again next month. Bye bye. We'll be there.